Welcome to the 47th episode of Cartoon Avatars. I'm your host, Logan Bartlett. And on this episode, you're going to hear a conversation that I had with Kara Swisher, who was the uh, founder of Recode, founder of All Things D, Code Conference, in addition to uh, her podcast, Pivot, with Scott Galloway, as well as on with Kara Swisher. We talk about a bunch of different things. We talk about uh, the how the tech industry has changed, talk about a favorite interview, talk about uh, television shows. She's watching a bunch of, a bunch of interesting uh, stuff, a fun conversation. I really appreciate her coming on. Uh, so that's what you're going to hear next. And just a reminder, uh, a request that I'm now doing to please like, subscribe, uh, follow all that stuff on the YouTube page, Spotify, Apple uh, podcast, wherever it is you listen. It's really appreciated. Um, we're trying to drive view counts. I think last week was one of our best episodes we've ever had. And so uh, really appreciate it if everyone else uh, continues to do that. Um, so thanks, everyone, for listening. And uh, trust you'll enjoy this episode here now. All right. Kara Swisher, thank you. Uh, thank you for doing this. For people that don't know, I can't imagine too many people that don't know Kara Swisher that uh, are listening to this, but uh, just a quick primer. Uh, people probably know Kara as the host of Pivot uh, and on with Kara Swisher, co-founder of Recode, the Code Conference, co-founder of All Things D, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Kara, thanks for, uh, thanks for doing this. No problem. No problem at all. You've been in tech, covering tech for for a little while now. A long while, um, yeah. And uh, and you you've seen the evolution, I guess, of the industry uh, mm -hmm. across a bunch of different generations of founders and all that. Is there mm -hmm. something as you sort of look back to when you started covering it versus today? Is there anything that's uh, particularly stands out uh, that's not uh, noticeably different about either the the founders themselves, the industry at large? Anything that jumps out to you? Well, they're obscenely wealthy and uh, become more and more uh, away from regular living a regular life. But Bill Gates and Michael Dell were obscenely wealthy back in the day, Not, right? Yes, they were, certainly. But I mean, really early. I met them a lot earlier than that. But, um, you know, yeah, sure. But it's a whole different scene. I mean, I think the wealth and power and size of these companies, they didn't, you know, there wasn't a Facebook. It was very small. I, I remember Google in the garage and stuff like that. And so they've churned from small startups into enormous conglomerates, essentially. And so it's a very big difference. And as over time, I've gotten more and more uh, isolated, I would say, I would say hard to reach, hard to talk to. Are the people that have stayed, um, I guess, grounded over the mm -hmm. course of whatever, the fame and the richness mm -hmm. and all of that, are there any commonalities you've seen across the people that have been able to do that? Uh, most of them have been adults, like Reed Hastings is the same as when I met him when he started it. He was an adult when he started it, and he's an adult now. And so, I, you know, a lot of people who started not in their 20s, maybe. Um, Mark Benioff is the same as when he started Salesforce. I remember that. Um, some like Brian Chesky were just really nice people. He has very nice parents. I know it sounds crazy. I've met many people's parents, and he has very grounded parents. Uh, and so I think his mom's a social worker. His dad was some sort of... Um, you know, not construction, but it's something in that area. And so he had a ground, very grounded family. So it just depends. I think a lot of the ones that are most normal are the ones that started off as adults in the first place and were already formed people and rather than, you know, this is their first job kind of thing. Yeah. It's interesting. Now we've sort of moved to this time period where uh, the CEOs are, are basically unelected world leaders, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. With, with a lot of power and responsibility. Yeah, certainly. Is there anything you would do if you could to, to change that construct or is it just the state that we're in right you now? We need you to can't shut them up. Like, you know, you're going to tell them to shut up, except like stop weighing in on things. You know, it's sort of when they tell celebrities to stay in their lane, I never like that. They can say whatever they want. And, yeah. Shut you know, up and dribble. Yeah. Whatever. I hate that. I, they have, they have lives. They have their citizens in the United States and they can say whatever they want or wherever country they're from. Um, I think it's fine. It, they just don't, you know, like Elon Musk going on about Ukrainian geopolitical issues doesn't seem to be the person I want to listen to on that issue. Um, he just waited on Kevin McCarthy, like whatever. He's a big, so he's been a long time supporter of him. So go ahead, knock him, knock yourself out kind of thing. Um, and so, yeah, sure. They, they can do it. I, I think they, I don't think, I don't listen to what most of them have to say about politics unless I feel like they have a certain expertise. It's just their opinion. Just like it's my mother's opinion, I think. Do you have any opinions about the current state of, of propaganda within tech and how these companies are, are using it? Well, they're now letting everything in now. If you noticed, you know, Twitter just changed its political advertising policy that was put in place in 2019. Now anything goes. You saw um, 
this football player, this Buffalo Bills football player got hit and they're letting all the COVID misinformation go around. It has nothing to do with COVID, but nonetheless, they're just letting it go. So, I mean, it's essentially propaganda is all this falseness. It's not, you know, it's not necessarily dedicated to being anything but chaotic. And so, you know, now it's just anybody can say anything like, you know, just even, but that has happened for ever. It's just more amplified now. And so I think we're just going to, I have a feeling that a lot of these sites have given up on just content moderation. It's almost an impossible task, but I feel like they've given up on it completely. Um, and they're just going to let things go across their, their platforms and let it go. And that is propaganda. And whoever is the loudest and most, um, I mean, just watching this house thing, everything used to be backdoor negotiations. Everything's happening in public and in real time. Is that a good thing, a bad thing? I don't know. Um, it's all propaganda in a lot of ways. They're all trying to push their own agendas. But, um, you know, I think the problem is you don't, it's very hard to take facts out of what's actually happening versus what people are spinning. And so now everyone's doing essentially public propaganda, um, which you can see, um, but it doesn't make it any less dangerous. What do you think about the role of uh, journalists in, in in because journalists were for the longest time kind of the gatekeepers and helped us verify mm -hmm. versus the random person spouting off right and this isn't sure. necessarily a new trend I mean you were pioneering yeah. the blog world but mm -hmm. now everyone is a blogger and that's been true right. for ten fifteen years but now almost in an unfiltered way everyone's a blogger yeah. Is that a good thing? Is there any way the toothpaste goes back in the tube? Well, it's good when there's voices you haven't heard of. There's all kinds of really interesting voices. Again, whatever the news of the day, this happens to be the, what's happening in Congress. But you can you can look at a lot of people's opinions in real time. And some people are very smart that don't work for NBC or CBS or the New York Times, and they have very good takes. And so I like that part of it. It's like, oh, I hadn't thought of that. And this person would know because they worked in Congress for this many years. So I think giving voice to more experts is always a good thing. I think the downside is that you give voice to idiots, right? You give voice to people who are just are like, this is what I think happened. And you're like, that, that's not what happened. But um, so it's it's sort of a plus and minus thing. Where do you encourage, I mean, you have a college age son, is that right? I have one of my sons is in college. The other yeah. is going to be going next year. Mm -hmm. Where do you encourage him? Or if, if you do, I where don't. would you like for him to get his information from? Wherever he wants to. I don't, I don't control my kids' information. Um, the older kids, at least. Um, I, uh, I, they, interestingly, we were just on a vacation with all four kids and the, uh, my son and I were talking a lot about where he gets his information. My oldest son who's at NYU and he, he gets a lot, interestingly from YouTube. He gets, he watches news on YouTube. He watches, he d he's on Reddit, which I think is much more moderated, which is interesting because he likes seeing some of the videos and memes and what's happening there. Um, and I think that's where he's getting his information. I thought it was fine. I mean, he's very, he's a good connoisseur of information. They cer he certainly knows what's happening and is accurate. Um, he watched my other son who's 17 watches a lot of videos on YouTube and they're, I uh, hear him listening to them and they're quite good, right? They're really good informational news videos. Um, and so they're not, they're not sitting themselves in front of the TV set and watching, you know, like I do, I watched Stephanie rule interview Lauren Boebert last night, for example. Um, they're not doing that. They're doing, they're finding the news where it's coming through, but they certainly feel, it feels like they know, I haven't found them to say anything that's just like, that's just not true, but they're very co good connoisseurs of where they get it. But I find they get it on, on their phones from a YouTube or a Reddit and, uh, and then have a bunch of people. They both watch, for example, John Oliver. They love John Oliver. Um, there's a couple of people they listen to, a couple of reporters they've suddenly liked and they follow them and they're very good reporters. And so they're, they're, they're really good. I think younger people are very good at, at getting their information sources, the ones they like. Yeah, much easier to go direct or at least uh, crowdsource. They're journalists. No, they're journalists. They're not. They're. I think they're watching. I mean, John Oliver. What is he? He's a good commentator. He's a good yeah. synopsizer of the news. I. I think he's accurate. Um. So I don't. And he's funny. And so that's an interesting. He. He. They're very up on the news. And then they. You know, they form opinions. He might have, for example. But that's okay. They. They can think for themselves. They yeah, don't read right. newspapers. They certainly don't listen to radio. 
they list they sometimes listen to podcasts but sometimes not they don't listen to mine i can tell you that it's interesting i mean as a form factor podcasts and youtube seem to be converging so much uh mm -hmm. the video aspect and all the mm -hmm. all this stuff and so mm -hmm. it's a youtube's done a really impressive job of uh being that source of information yeah i think the reason they like it is they find tiktok which is another source of information for a lot of young people for sure a lot of people in general um they find it too performative and too slick and so they sort of like the 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 looser uh, the less professionalization of YouTube and Reddit, I think that's my impression is that they find uh, they find TikTok a little just a little just the way a lot of people find Instagram performative. Uh, I think it's the same thing. They feel the same way about Instagram. Yeah, they think it's more as a as a peacocking kind of place. I've heard you say that podcasts need to be uh, e either useful or entertaining or some combination mm -hmm. uh, of both information that you can't get anywhere else. Mm -hmm. Your your history with podcasts, you first started doing it when? Oh, uh, I started the podcast division at Vox. Interestingly, me and an intern. I was running the website and I was doing their. Uh, I was doing the Code Conference for many years. Of course, it was before that the All Things D Conference, and I just was very interested. I wanted someone else to run the website of the news site because I was tired of being an editor, um, and I just was riveted by podcasts. And so I took an intern and we started it and we started doing interviews because the Code Conference. Uh, we could only interview just a few people a year, 16 or something like that. And there were so or hundreds of people and we could do two a week. And that was 300 people that we could interview. Um, and so it was, um, or hundred and sorry, a hundred and hundred, hundred and some people interviewed. If we did more, I think we did it three times a week to start. Um, and so we could do really good interviews. And I just thought the podcast medium was really interesting. So it was 10, almost 10 years ago. Um, we were very early to the idea of it. And what do you think uh, of its current uh, form today in the state, the proliferation? It feels like it's really taken off. I mean, I started yeah. doing this a year ago. And so it feels like uh, everyone uh, jokingly uh, says podcast, that they have a podcast yeah. these days. Yeah. Right? Um, you know, some are better than others. There's lots of them. Uh, you know, it's a question of whether they can make money. Ours does. Makes a lot of money. But, you know, I think there's there's going to be a shakeout. And, you know, this idea of buying them for enormous amounts of money is I never that wasn't really the point. I mean, I think they can be very good businesses. Um, if you are very serious about making it a business, other people just want to yammer on and that's fine too. Um, but I do think it's getting, you know, there's definitely, when I started, there was no, we, there was no services to make them. There was no advertising to speak of. There was no, it was really interesting. We did a lot of it on our own. And so now it's quite, you know, it's like any other media or thing. There's ad agencies, there's, uh, you know, guests are very attuned to it. Um, it's not, you don't have to explain it to anybody, um, and, and things like that. And so I, 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 you know, it's just the professionalization of it and you're going to see a shakeout of that and people can still make them if they want. It's sort of like internet news websites. There's some that are professional and others that are just for people's, their own interest. Are there any that you particularly have enjoyed listening to in the last couple of years that, that have popped up? I'm making five a week, so or four yeah. a week. So I'm not, I don't have a lot of time and I have four kids. So I don't spend a lot of time doing anything but my own work. But, you know, I listen to various ones. Um, I, of course, everyone listens to daily, but I don't listen to that daily anymore. Um, I know the news. I don't need them to tell me, but I like it. I think it's really good. Um, you know, I, I, I dabble in various things. I like to do ones that aren't in my genre, like around food and history and things like that. Um, so I tend to do those more than news podcasts. Um, but I don't have time. I honestly don't listen to a lot of podcasts. Yeah. Even though. I listen to the Dolly Parton podcast, obviously. That's a, that's one I'll need to search for. Um, yeah, Dolly's Ameri Dolly Parton's America. It's great. It's really. I, well she done. had a Netflix, uh, or there was a documentary of hers on Netflix. There was. This yeah. was a this was a podcast. It was by the son of the man that she worked with at Vanderbilt to give all that money to Vanderbilt yeah. around COVID. Uh, and it was great. The only part, she, she talked on it a lot. That was what I liked is I got to hear from her. The only part of it, just one is he was a bit of, of a fan and I want to hear about her business a little bit more because I think she's a, quite a business mind. That's one thing I'm super interested in. She sort of, she sort of defaults to this adorable Dolly thing, yeah. like little corn pone. And I like that, but she's a very savvy businesswoman. And I'd like to hear her talk about that more than, uh, you know, you know, shouldn't we all get along? Sure. But let me talk about your IP, like kind of thing. I would be more interested in that. Um, and also he he talked more than she did. And I was like, you need to stop talking and let her talk. That's all. I just, I would just let her talk. That's what I would do. It's a, uh, it's a good um, thing to keep in mind oftentimes yeah. that uh, uh -huh. you're, you're here to interview someone else. Uh, yeah. 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 
I mean, it's I'm perfectly fine for the questions, but at some point I was like, I don't care how you feel about Dolly Parton. I would like me to feel about it. It was funny. I was I, I yell I yelled at the podcast quite a bit. Is she the coolest person in America? Oh, there's a lot of cool people. But yeah, she's one of them. She's right she's up there. there. What? Yeah. Have you always been a fan of hers? Is it of is course, it the music? Yeah. Is it who she no. is? No, early days. I love her music. I love her very early music when she was with Porter Wagner, and I followed her for a long, long time. I'm big. I'm a big country music fan, um, especially early, early stuff. But I like pop, pop country music too. I like most of it, but I like the old stuff, and a lot of her old stuff is just amazing. The old stuff. When you say country, what do you think the the prime of it is? What's what uh, what time? Oh, frame you know, I early Johnny Cash. I listened to bluegrass. I, I had had living in the Washington area. I spent a lot of time at uh, at different bluegrass venues here, and uh, just old country. Uh, you know, oh gosh, my son listens to it all now. Um, just everybody, Loretta Lynn. Does, and, does he like the the older stuff? Or he is does. He, he likes. Yeah. He does. He likes the older stuff. Yeah, he listens to a lot of early Johnny Cash. He listens to a lot of early Loretta Lynn. Um, a whole bunch of people that I hadn't actually heard of, but he's found and sent me and stuff like that. And so uh, we listen to it together. Actually, we we were just on a trip and listened to a whole bunch of country music. I've struggled with the newer pop country. I uh, I sort of had the. I was very. My family's from the South, Alabama and Tennessee, and so. I, I mm-hmm. really grew up in the 80s and 90s with like the Garth Brooks mm-hmm. and George Strait and like that whole genre. I love Garth Brooks. Yeah, I like Trisha Yearwood, everything else. Yeah. But there's earlier than that. But go oh, ahead. Sure. Sorry. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. That was that was my coming of age. Well, uh, good. Yeah. Conway Twitty is someone I really yeah, like. Yeah, sure. George Jones. And, you know, it's just you can go way back, you know, and I think I, I, Bluegrass was something in a lot of names you don't know as well. Um, I, I just. I've always followed it. I just love it. I just find it very moving and beautiful. And she was, she was quite, you know, very early Dolly Parton. I like later Dolly Parton too. I think I like all Dolly Partons, every Dolly yeah. Parton there is. So now one unique thing I feel like, uh, in, in having watched, uh, mm-hmm. you know, your videos and listened to your podcast and all of mm-hmm. the years, uh, I feel like you uniquely, um, I would say, do not give a fuck what people yeah, right. think. And I don't know if you would characterize it as that, uh, sure. but is that something that came innately to you or is yes. that something that was developed over time? Uh, just thick skin. No, I think that one of the things that's important in podcasting and anywhere in life is you have to be genuine to yourself, right? A lot of people try to put these ideas of yourself on that aren't familiar to you yourself. And so I am, this is the way I've been since I've been in fourth grade. And so, uh, you know, very outspoken, very much, I don't understand that. What are you doing? Like, I'm you sure your I mean? fourth like, grade teacher uh, yeah, she yeah, didn't, had yeah, interesting I, notes for your, I, for your I mom. walked out of, my mom has a, I walked out of fourth grade and I said, I already learned this. Why are you boring me with this kind of thing? So that's who I was in fourth grade. So it's not a new, fresh personality trait for me. But one of the things that was really important was, it is important in any medium, and it, it, even if you're like the Kardashians, you're genuine to yourself, right? They are genuinely themselves, and so I think that's what that's how you get successful in uh, in in media in general is how your you, your people really do respond to genuine self your selfness, um, and I think it's really important, um, uh, and that's. You know, you can't you can't fake that. And so I am the way I am. And you either like it um, or you don't. Right. And so that's the thing is if they don't like your your act, essentially, or, or the way you are, uh, then they're not going to like your podcast, if that makes sense. They're yeah. not going to like, you know, well, so I tend to try to be myself. You also have a uh, ability to get people to want you to like them too, which I don't know mm-hmm. exactly what, what that is, but yep. what was it? Mark Andreessen called it a, I forget. Stockholm his, syndrome. Stockholm yeah. syndrome. Yes. Isn't he clever? Your, your, your captors are mm-hmm. uh, who you're ultimately trying to win over. Yeah, exactly. He called it, I thought that was silly, but whatever. He can yeah. say whatever he wants. Now, uh, is there something that you would say uniquely is not obvious in, um, that, that that has led to your success or if there was a young enterprising person looking at you and saying, uh, you know, this is someone mm-hmm. I want to emulate. I think I was a really good reporter, you know, and I mean, that's really, I was a really good reporter, a beat reporter for many years. And I think that's the most important part of me. Like, uh, that's where I got it. So I'm able to say things about things because I reported on them for years. Like I have a very long history of being a, uh, a, a reporter for, um, you know, for, for all the internet companies. And it gave me a certain 
insight to what was happening there. And I think that's really helpful. And so a lot of what I say is not off the top of my head. It's because I've covered these people. I know what they're doing. I'm aware. Now, I'm not a daily news reporter anymore. I'm much more of a columnist, opinion analyst, but it's based on reported information. And so it gives it a, a, you have to really know your stuff. And I think expertise is critically important, whether I'm listening to someone talk about, um, you know, I really hate cable because a lot of people on cable don't know what they're talking, like they just talk on any topic. And I find that offensive. Um, I'm often invited onto cable and they'll have a topic and I'm like, I don't know anything about that. And they're like, still come on and talk about it. I'm like, no, I refuse. I refuse to talk about something. I don't know. Like Kevin McCarthy, I just, I'm a, I'm a citizen and I can watch it and I can talk about the, the implications for how it's being in real time on social media that I get. But I'm not gonna. I don't know the ins and outs of what's happening there. It just seems like chaotic to me, and that's that's the only thing I can insight I can have. I don't think it's a fresh one, and so I think it's important to have expertise in whatever you're doing. And, and when you're interviewing people, you you tend to not script the conversation, right, and just sort of right. let it go. No. And what so so when you're coming into a conversation with someone, is there something that you want to hit? these uh, particular things or how does I, I that actually work? I prepare a little bit more. I, 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 most of the people I, I'm interested in, if that makes sense, I really do. I am interested in the people, right? So I don't interview people I'm not interested in and that's really important. So one of the things I try to do is, is really um, pick people I like, or I, I'm interested in talking to them in some fashion. And that's, that's the, that's the most important part. It just is. Um, then we spend a lot of time reading up on people. I listen to some interviews, not all of them of what people have done to find out what their little shtick is. So I don't, they don't fall into their, uh, into whatever they want to say over and over again. I think that's important. Um, I also spend a lot of time, um, uh, trying to do something different. What is interesting to me? And so it's my interview, not the interview. And I think a lot of people do the same interview over and over and over again. And so I try to do different interviews, um, again, by using the lens of me versus anybody else, essentially. Yeah. Interesting. It's, have you found a difference of interviewing people in person versus remote? Like, do you get more out of people? Um, sometimes my live interviews I'm talking about with an audience work better because I'm good in front of an audience and it can be funnier. Like I did a great interview with Bob Iger at, in Richmond, which when he left Disney for the first time, and that was a really good interview because we get along, we have a great rapport and it worked really well in front of people. Um, but in general, remotes worked rather well. I'm surprised how well, you know, this, we use Riverside also has been, I'm surprised how intimate you could get, um, Although I think probably my best interviews have been like uh, I did. Uh, um, I'm trying to think. Anyone I do in person tends to be a little better of of, of an in, of an interview. Are there interviews that you're particularly proud of that when you look back, like what immediately comes to mind in terms of interviews that you you that you would direct people towards or that you're you're particularly um, proud of? Oh, a lot of them. I I I I think it's really there's a lot of interviews I've done that are that are great. Um, you know, I, I tend to say my last interview was, was great. Yeah. You know, I thought, I thought I did one with Monica Lewinsky that was fresh because she'd been interviewed a lot, but I think I had a different take on her and it turned out to be a very emotional, interesting interview about someone who really got the short end, who acted the best in this entire saga and ended up with the worst outcome. Right. And I thought that was a really interesting interview. I did a, I, I did an interesting interview with Kathy Griffin in person in South by Southwest. Now she's known as sort of like sort of the shock jock of comedians, but she was in a very vulnerable position because she had been, you know, she couldn't fly anymore. She was on the no fly list over just a stupid photo. It was a tasteless photo, but a stupid photo. I thought that was a very insightful, much more serious. People are expecting her just to kid all the time. And I got her to a place. I thought that was good. Obviously the interview I did with, um, uh, with the 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 CEO of Parlor on the day of the um of the uh um insurrection on January 6th was very emotional. Often when I'm emotional or I have I reach people emotionally, they tend to be better. Um and often that's in person. That's I I like to do certain people in person cuz I think you get a better uh interview with them. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Have you uh, tactics wise if you're not getting out of someone what what you'd like or if mm -hmm. something's just totally going off the rails how, how do you mm -hmm. handle those those situations of trying to bring them back in i'm okay with them going off the rails um i i think it's fine i i'm i'm good with that um i think it's really important to um um 
to let that happen. Like I, when I was talking to Elon and one, he got mad over my opinions about his ridiculous behavior around COVID. Um, and so I, um, I was very much um, pushing back on the way he behaved around the factories and what he was doing to local, lo- local regulators and stuff. And he threatened to leave. And I was like, okay, bye. Like, I, you know what I mean? Like, so there's been a bunch like that that have been super tense often with him because he's very, he's speaking of emotional, he's highly emotional. Um, and, and so that was interesting, like that back and forth. He didn't end up leaving. Of course they never do. Um, and, uh, so that wasn't, he, he and those interviews have been very good when we have them because they're, because he's right there with me. Because you bring him up, uh, you had said when he took the job that you, he would rank high on your list of people that could, that could help fix Twitter. I did. I, I did think that. I do not think that now. Yeah. I, I think you said it's one of the biggest disappointments or, or I forget yes. the exact quote, but who else was on that list of people that, uh, could have been good at, at running Twitter? I, you know, a lot, there's a lot of, not just cause he's like everyone, I'm not, it's, I'm not in the, uh, he's such a genius mode. I just think he was an active user of it and he's got the means and money and contacts, right? So he's got a lot of support. So he, and he, he loves the product or he, whatever he has with the product relationship he has with the product. Um, you know, I didn't think there was a lot of people. I thought in the hands of a Microsoft, it might've done okay. Disney, not so much. Um, I thought it would have been interesting if Google bought it. You know, I thought those were kind of interesting owners. Um, you know, there's certain CEOs I've named that I thought would be good. I thought Susan Wojcicki, who runs yep. YouTube, would have been good. Um, I thought Brett Taylor, who was the chairman, might have done a good job. Stuart Butterfield, who ran Slack. These are people who have the, you know, I'm very interested in if they have the actual expertise in media. Um, I think one of Elon's problems is he just doesn't understand media in any way. He just understands loudness, um, which is not media. And so I think Twitter's a media organization. And so, um, and of course, a technical organization, but less that than a media organization. And so I think he's had a real hard time doing a good job of it. And he's also, it's also about him. I, I, I did a really interesting interview just this week with Tony Fidel, who's written a book called Build. He's sure. of course, father of the iPod, et cetera. Um, and one of the th- lists he have is list of assholes in tech. And, you know, he, he calls himself one too. Um, and he said, there's a difference between an ego driven uh, asshole and a mission driven asshole, which meaning the the second is more useful and Elon has shifted from a mission driven asshole to an ego driven asshole. And it's not, it's never a good thing. Do you feel like the media obsesses a little too much about Twitter? Uh, no. It- in this nihilist attitude of, of what all is going on over there? No, I think it's, I think, you know, listen, people are like, oh, too much. Fun. I'm like the world's richest man with the most important platform for politicians. And um, are you kidding me? Uh, that, it's, it's important. I don't care how you slice it. It's an important thing. And so you could say it's not important, but it's not just not true. It's just not true. It's, it's a very, um, uh, it's, it, 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 it captures the attention of, politicians and media across the world, less so celebrities. Uh, it may be small, but it's influential. And so, and again, it's the world's richest man doing it, who also happens to be knee deep in Ukraine, is knee deep in China stuff, uh, is doing cars, is doing rockets. It's, it's, not a, it's not a trivial story. It's not. It's about influence and power and propaganda. It's, there's no way this is an uninteresting story. If you were 22 years old uh, Mm -hmm. and back in your Washington Post days, uh, where what area would you be hunting out? Would you would you still go to tech or because it's kind of become um, uh, fossilized in some ways or like the big Mm -hmm. players are are, are in their spots? Are there different areas? that They're not fossilized. Boy, they're very powerful. I mean, it's interesting that, you know, they're not they're not losing a step necessarily. So, Maybe locked in is a, or the big players seem to be somewhat uh, uh, positioned as incumbents uh, mm-hmm. with, with not quite the same level of disruption that there was right. when you originally sure. got on the beat. Um, sure. Would you want to cover, because it, it seems you, you you moved away from politics, right? Like right. that was yep. something you didn't want to do. And in yep. some ways- Well, you have to now, right? You kind of have to. Yeah. Essentially. Yeah. Tech so. has sort of doubled back around to politics. Is there mm-hmm. another area that you would pursue or do you think this is a, a, an uh, interesting one? You know, I, I'm very interested in climate change tech. I'm very interested in climate change in general and the innovation around it we have to do. I spent a lot of time spending a lot more time on EVs, a lot more time on carbon issues or a battery, um, everything, you know, efficiency. Um, and so we did a whole day of that at Code this year because I happen to be interested in it. And so... 
there's that. Um, and I also spend um, a lot of time thinking about healthcare, as most people do. I've never, I'm not as uh, interested in that right now, but there's some really interesting things happening uh, around that. And so if I was younger, I'd cover climate change tech. Yeah. Almost you could do thing. yoga with Chris Saka as well. Yeah, right. right. Ha, ha, ha. Does he do yoga? I don't know. I can't yeah. imagine. So, um, no, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you left San Francisco uh, mm-hmm. a couple years ago? Uh, yeah, I still had a house there. I was you still had a house several, there. Several weeks there recently. What, um, what's your perspective on the state of San Francisco, innovation, valley, all that stuff that se- seems to have been? Well, it's fun. moved everywhere. It's, it's definitely moved everywhere, right? It's not just, and I actually had a great time in San Francisco. I love the people that just have to pile, you know, the people who have left that have to pile on. I'm like, just leave, like, just goodbye. Go, go to your little weird home in Miami and enjoy it when it gets covered by uh, water someday, <laughs> like, because that's what's happening. Like, we may have earthquakes and wildfires. Yeah, exactly. But I, I think, you know, there, there, doesn't have to be one place. And actually, it's a very different city with all the tech bros moved out. It certainly is. Um, so I don't think there has to be one place. But nonetheless, the big companies still exist in that area, the whole wider Bay Area and Pacific Northwest. They still, you know, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook, Google, um, Netflix, they're all in the same place. They're all in the same, close to the same places. And so that where they were before. And so all the big companies continue, the big power of Apple continue to be located in that area. But people have obviously dissipated and that's that's totally normal. It seems like maybe you've given up on your ambitions of potentially being a local politician in San Francisco. I don't know. I was just there and I get, did a session about with Casey Newton about what was going on in tech for the year. Um, and I love San Francisco so much. And someone said, are we weirdly like you to run for mayor? And I was like, I really would like to run for mayor, but probably not. Uh, I'm old. I had more, I, instead of having running for mayor, I had two more kids. So that's taken up a lot of my time. So I, I think it's hard to have, I'm really not young. And so having kids at an older age and four of them is, is seems to be what I'm doing instead of being mayor of San Francisco. You're awfully ambitious. Uh, I am. Both, both kids and new projects yeah. and all that. Yeah, I do a lot. I have a lot of jobs. And so I have two, four podcasts a week. I've got a book I'm working on. I've got lots of stuff. And so I, I, I would like to get back to San Francisco to start with and then see where we go from there. But I think it's still a wonderful, wonderful city. Now, are you optimistic about the role tech's going to, I mean, you just had two kids over the course of mm-hmm. the pandemic. Yeah, two more kids. Are you optimistic about the role tech's going to play in their lives over the next, whatever, 50, um, You know, watching years? my older kids, I'm fine. They they have a very healthy relationship with technology. And and uh, interestingly enough, their other mom I'm divorced from was the chief technology officer of the United States under Obama, worked for Google. And you'd think we were, that they would be more tech interested, but they're just not. Uh, my kids are not that interested in tech. They, they use it as a tool. I think they have a very healthy relationship with tech, actually, um, a relatively healthy one. I don't find them as addicted as I am, for sure. Um, and so I, I, I feel kind of good about their, about their relationship. I don't know about the younger kids. I mean, the most they do in tech right now, they're three and one. The one-year-old doesn't use tech at all, um, but the three-year-old watches Frozen on Endless Loop. So is that tech or is it just the evilness of D- Disney that it insinuates itself into every aspect of a child's life. So yeah, well, <laughs> I like I, Disney, but there's something going on. We share a, uh, a uh, skepticism of Disney world. Oh, Disney my Land, brother loves and all it. I've been a lot, you know, I've been a lot of, course. we did an offsite uh, two years ago or a year ago there. Oh, and, really? Uh, they asked Which my one? opinion and I said, are you actually asking my opinion? Because <laughs> that sounds like the worst thing. But if you're asking yeah. if, I, if I will go, I will be yeah, there. Yeah. Everything sure. smells vaguely of, um, cinnamon rolls. Like I asked, <laughs> right. I called Bob Iger when I was there once. I'm like, why does everything smell like cinnamon rolls? Uh, he wouldn't tell me, but I found out that apparently they pump in the smell. It's not actually cinnamon. It's it like smells. oxygen in Vegas and whatever. Cinnamon rolls yeah, and- it's yeah, it was cinnamon rolls. I was like, I do not want to be a place that smells of cinnamon rolls. Um, but you know, they're fine. I, you know, I've been to all of them. I, I, I've been on a Disney cruise even oddly enough. Um, uh, he wouldn't do an interview with me until I went so I could talk. About wow. It. Well, that you know, but commitment. I needed to understand it. I, I, it was flawless. It was endless, uh, soft serve and, uh, flawlessly executed. I have to say. I assume not something you'll do again. Never again. I'm not going to, the other kids are not going to get the benefit of that. Um, so, you know, I, I, I appreciate how good they are actually in terms of, how they do things. So that's all. I wanted to see them, their business in action. And you can't talk about it, someone's business unless you've actually either understood it really closely. Again, it's, it's being an expert on it. 
And I am an expert on soft serve on a Disney cruise for sure. We all we all have our domain areas. They're trying to get you to talk about Kevin McCarthy. They should yeah. have been asking about soft yeah. serve ice cream. Yeah. Disney. Although I have to say, what's really interesting, you know, it, it, social media can be so reductive and so could you know cable media. Um, all they talk about is the pizza that's being delivered to Congress. I'm literally like, it has nothing to do. They're eating. What a shock, you know, because they're up late at night. And I wish they would actually talk about what's actually happening versus what they're eating. Anyway, that's just my little. Now, uh, what are your other pro- podcasts or has been Secession, uh, which I mm-hmm. am a big fan of? Are Me you going to do that again for season season I am. four? I am. I just I just agreed to do it. Uh, I lo- I'm doing it purely as a fan. Uh, and so I uh, I love the show and I, uh, I love the creators. I've done something with HBO every year, whether it was Silicon Valley um, or well, I did something else for another. I, I got to know Richard Puppet really well. And so I would interview the cast of Silicon Valley every year at their opening event or, and so this was just presented to me as the next thing and I love it and I'm a big fan. And so I agreed to do it. Is it really inspired by the Murdochs or, uh, well, they try to pretend it isn't. They definitely like not the Murdochs. It's a lot of people. They say that I, they spent a lot of time saying that, but I'm like, it's the Murdochs. Yeah. I know, I know the Murdochs. It's the Murdochs. Um, so they, they, uh, I don't work for them and I don't, you know, I, it's about the Murdochs as far as I can tell. And maybe a little bit of, you know, um, Sumner Redstone thrown in, you, you know, knowing these people, you can see bits and pieces. The guy who's the, the, the internet guy is a little Elon for sure. Um, so you can see bits and pieces. They've done that a lot. Even on Silicon Valley, you could see characters were Marissa Mayer or, uh, Peter Thiel, you know, there were bits and, and I know that cause I was actually a consultant to them on that show. So, um, so they're, you know, they try to pretend it's all fictional, but okay, sure. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I, I love when they do it. Well, not the Murdochs. I'm like, no, not the Murdochs. It can't possibly be the Murdochs. <laughs> It's fun. Do you have any predictions for what what's uh, who's? I actually- don't. I'm going to see it earlier than everybody else because we're doing the show. We're doing the podcast, so I'll. I'm not going to let you know because they'll kill me. Um, but uh, I don't know where they're going to go. It'll be interesting with the kids on the outs, uh, but still, you know, financially benefiting from this deal um, and what they do and how Gojo, I guess Gojo takes over and what does this Rupert Murdoch like character do now that he's not really in power the other guy is that that's going to be tough for him and you know and he's also in his waning days whether he likes it or not even if he wields a lot of power he remains in his the end of his life not the beginning between so. logan roy and logan paul uh my name was pretty innocuous oh, for like logan 20 paul. 20 yeah. years of my life logan <laughs> or with the first 35 uh, 32 or so it was pretty yeah. innocuous to be named logan and then now we have Logan Roy and Logan Paul uh, yeah. doing, doing some damage to all the Logans out there. Apparently his NFT thing wasn't all that. Was Maybe there was some bad actors. Oh, God. <laughs> That's a bad Logan. I like Logan's run. Um, yes. I, I love that, Brian. Uh, and Wolverine guy. as well, right? That's you, right. You like Logan, Wolverine. that's right. He's so that's Wolverine. a good one. Yeah, that's a good one. Although he's trouble. Trouble. Yes. Um, the guy, Brian, what's his name, who plays Logan Roy? Um, Cox. Cox. Uh, Cox is amazing as a person. I have interviewed him and ah, oh, what a fantastic guy. He, he is so, you know, he's written two very good books. Um, just a funny, he's just like, the. I'll tell you, he's not, he's, chan, he's, he's not channeling Rupert Murdoch. He's channeling Brian Cox in a lot of ways. And, is that right? Yeah. As, as, as if he was Logan Roy, but he's what, what a hell of a, actor he is and what a hell of a person he's a great guy he was on with uh andy cohen and uh, yeah. uh for anderson cooper for new year's Whoa. oh he was yeah he tell him to fuck off Go yeah they, they had him on and he was uh he was he was entertaining yeah he's really such a clever man i just did a i did an event a live event uh for the show um with the whole cast which was so funny it was wonderful they were all lovely every one of them and he was exact he was just He's, he's, I was really loved. I love talking to him. He was fantastic. Everyone says, uh, what's his name that plays Kendall Roy, Jeremy Strong yeah. is, uh, uh I, there were, there were a lot of reports initially that he was like very method actor. He very, really is. He's, yeah. an, he, I have to say, he's definitely like that. He's very, he's a very specific person <laughs> yes. to put it. He was very like, he's just, he's, they're, they're a lot like their characters, um, in a weird way, although the guy who plays Greg is really very, he's a lovely, funny, funny guy, serious. He's not, he's very, he's not like 
Greg. <laughs> he's not like Greg. He's. Perfect. I think he actually owns a bar. I live on the Lower East Side, and he owns he's a very bar. hip. Yeah, he owns a bar around the corner, and he'll he'll be. Uh, you know, I'll get a text at eleven thirty yeah. on a Saturday night. Yeah, that he's like he's bar very training. hip. He seemed very hip to me. I was like, whoa, you're pretty hip. And shit, the woman who plays Shiv uh, is really wonderful. Really smart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jay Smith Cameron. I've gotten to know her on uh, on Twitter of all places, and she plays Jerry, and she is funny as can be. They're all great. They're Matthew McFadden's great. The whole cast is superb, and Kieran Calkin. You wouldn't have expected of him. You know, he's fantastic. Maybe 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 one of the best, most interesting characters. I, it's uh, yeah. All it, everybody is, even the minor characters like uh, Dagmara as a. Do, do, Dominix, uh, Carolina, just the oh, PR yeah, yeah. person. Everybody is Stewie, they're, Marsha Roy, they're all. Frank, the guy who plays Frank, I love him. And Fisher Stevens is good. They're just all, they're, they take care for every minor character to be spectacular at the same yeah. time. Yeah, Stewie's a familiar character in the world of hedge funds, I feel yep. like. I feel like yes. I, oh, know, yeah. oh, yeah. I know Stewie. Stewie's definitely in yep. my world a little bit. Yep, 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 100%. Well, oh, well, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, well, that's I was- why I had when they were doing that one deal uh, where they had a billionaire. I, I, I talked to Mark Cuban about it because he it seemed like it was like a lot like him, like that kind of guy. Oh, so. the one when they were out on the beach uh, yes. doing that? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that was great. And then the, the, the I, what I really liked was the um, when Cherry Jones was playing the family of uh, media people. It was a lot like the, it was a lot like the Grams. It was interesting because I worked the Washington Post. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that was, they've got it right. They certainly, certainly know media for sure. Yeah, they've, they've done a good job with it. What about uh, Silicon Valley? Did, so you, you did a show for that. Did you... Mm-hmm. Enjoy. I've had Dick Costello on, and he talked oh. about how much fun he had doing. I got him that job, by the way. Oh, is that right? When he was jobless, I helped put him together with those people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Did you uh, did you find it to be uh, an accurate representation and entertaining? No. I ultimately stopped watching it because it made me uncomfortable. It was a little too close to home. I it, it was it on enough. the nose. It was on the nose, but it was it was a it was a satire, obviously. Um, but I thought they had a lot of on that the 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 conjoined triangles of success. I thought was very so Eric Schmidty. Um, there was so much. And Matt Ross, who's played Gavin Belson, I got to know pretty well, and he's wonderful. What a he's also a playwright. And a really talented director, and um, Susan Cryer is someone I've stayed in touch with who played Lori. I thought she was brilliant. She was channeling Marissa, like three or four VCs, and Marissa Mayer at once, which I thought was great. Uh, ben Feldman, who played the the, the lawyer, was great. Mister Ten Percent, whatever, sit ten ten commas, three tray commas. Yeah, tray really commas. Funny. Yeah, that guy was funny. I just think I thought it was very on the nose. Uh, but at the same time, obviously a joke. And what was funny about it in the first season, when they were clearly making fun of everybody, um, they, the people in Silicon Valley, it's like, it's so funny. It's really like, you know, but it's, it's you know, it's a comedy. And I was like, they are utterly mocking you and you don't even see it. Like, that was my favorite part is how mocking they were of this group and um, and how much the people of Silicon Valley thought they weren't being mocked. That was my favorite part. Do you, do, do you think that, uh, is Silicon Valley more in on the joke or are there more people that are no. self-aware than there were once no. upon a time or you think it's the same? No, I think they have no sense of humor. Yeah. Look, look at Mark Andreessen these days. He has no sense of humor whatsoever. <laughs> he used to be an interesting person. Let me just say, he used to be. Do you think ultimately, I, I sort of call it the Kanye West thing, that like everyone in your life treats you differently? I mean, Kanye has mental oh, yeah. health and all that. But do you yeah. think that's ultimately the impact here is too much power and money? Yes, they got licked up and down all day and they used to be able to sustain disagreement or people who said, I don't agree with you about that. And now it's like you're a, you're an enemy if you say, ah, that's that doesn't seem right to me. Or you make a gentle criticism even. Um, they get angry and it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. They're, they're, it's It's a question of... That they, they they're pre offended their their grievances their they their grievance is high not all of them for sure but a lot of them are like how dare you I'm so smart and everyone thinks I'm rich and you know I'm rich and how dare you question my um uh they used to be a lot easier to deal with and they're now they do not tolerate dissent they surround themselves by people that lick them up and down it's full of enablers and minions who never go what the hell are you doing. What that? What's going on here? So therefore, they feel unfettered and cor- you know frequently wrong, but never in doubt. That seems to be a thing. Any trash television you're watching that that oh, you would recommend? 
a lot. I'm watching, um, what did I just finish? Oh, uh, co- Sex Lives of College Girls with Mindy Kaling, Mindy Kaling show. That's on HBO, right? Oh, it's so good. It's so good. It's such a funny, funny, funny. Um, I've just started to watch White Lotus. I just met the creators. They're, they uh, they like my podcast. And so I started listening. I just started that. How far into that are you? I just started the second season. I didn't even watch the first season. I just, that's when I, I didn't write. Uh, I, I just watched Glass Onion. I thought it was very funny. The Ed Norton's portrayal of the the, the idiot billionaire was wonderful. Uh, the whole Janelle Monet was amazing. Um, I love White I Lotus. I, I uh, do. People do. It's a unique, dark sense of humor about mm-hmm. a certain class of people, yes, yes. right? It's uh, on the nose. About the, about there's the some level people. of like Schadenfreude and mm-hmm. uh, gallows humor. Yeah, Jennifer Coolidge is amazing. You know, I just I, uh, I I I like that. I just finished A League of Their Own, which I thought was quite. I was yeah. shocked about how gay it was, a uh, lesbian it was. I was like, whoa, that's real lesbian. I was surprised. I didn't expect it to be because um, I just interviewed Gina Davis, uh, who's kind of, it's an upcoming podcast. Um, and uh, I'm trying to think of the things I, I watch a, a lot of stuff. I watched a great, uh, um, a great thing uh, on Netflix just recently with my sons. Let me look at it. It's called The Edge of Infinity. Um, it, it, it's it's wonderful. It's a documentary that was – their documentary is called A Trip to Infinity. I thought that was great. It was really uh, – you know, it's sort of pop science, so it's pop physics, but I liked it. Um, I watch a lot. It's just I watch a lot of stuff. We watch a lot of stuff. Yeah, I, I like- watched Dope Sick. I thought that was really fantastic. Yeah. And I love the dropout, I have to say. I thought that was also on the nose about Elizabeth Holmes. I thought that was, she was amazing. But, because you bring it up, do you think that's a, how much of an indictment should Theranos be on the valley and in innovation or, or, or the, the complex of Silicon Valley? Because in my world, a lot of people said, hey, there weren't really venture capitalists in the company, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Uh, that, that, you know, institutional investors, it was, it was a lot of, uh, I don't, I don't think it is. I think it wasn't a tech company. We didn't cover it at recode at all. Uh, yeah. you know, she, we didn't bring her on stage at code. She wasn't a tech person. So, I mean, there was Tim Braper was involved, Larry Ellison, certainly who handed up, forked over bucks, but it and Rupert Murdoch was in there, but it wasn't, I didn't think it, I thought it was a medical devices company. So we didn't cover it at all. Um, so I don't think it was an, it was an indictment of stupid, older men, I guess, like for falling for it. Uh, it's an, you know, it's just sort of like what's happening with FTX. It's just fraud, right? What do you do if someone's just going to lie like that and try to buy influence? It's not, it's really hard. And, and then take uh, advantage of FOMA around this could be the next big thing, right? If you lie enough, you can succeed until you don't, right? And so I don't think that's a new fresh story. I don't think it's about Silicon Valley. You had Bernie Madoff, you had all kinds of stuff. So I don't find that to be that interesting in that regard. I do think that the, the one I really liked a lot was We Crash. I thought Jared Leto, who I, I think is terrific. I've interviewed him several times. Um, uh, he did a great Adam Newman. Anne Hathaway was quite good as his wife, Rebecca. Um, I love that show. And I thought that was exactly the right tone about what happens. It's, people are suspending economic belief, you know, over like, yeah, it's got to work. Oh, Moss is in it. And this and Moss is on. And at the time, Scott and I and Pivot were very, we're like, this, this, as this filing, this federal filing is full of bad math. It can't work, you know? And what's this number and what's here? And we were very critical of it and got sort of a lot of pushback. But we were like, you know, there's an expression, there's a YouTube, there's an, in, excuse me, a TikTok star who's, who says the math ain't mathing. And the math wasn't mathing. And I, we kept going, math ain't mathing. And they're like, oh, it's a new, you have to, you know, it's going to be big, this and that. And I'm like, no, it's, a, it's there's no way this is going to work. Like, there's no way it's going to, it's going to, it's going to zero out a pencil out. And so I thought that show was quite good in depicting that. And so that I do think is indicative of a Silicon Valley, like everyone's on board with it. And to an extent FTX is, but I think that's more about FOMA and greed. I mean, the ability of liars to take advantage of that. Yeah, that was the, I sort of put on like uh, a spectrum to some extent where you have willful fraud, which is FTX yeah. and Theranos. And then you yeah. have like abuse of power and right. God complex and enablement and Uber and WeWork sort of on that yeah. side of it. Yeah, and, I think and- they knew what they were doing. I think they could see the economics of it. Like I remember getting up at one thing. I'm like, I'm sorry, this Uber's never going to make money. It's cool. Right, so is WeWork. Cool, but uh, Great not service. a very good business. I, not a- I, I always feel badly when uh, 
when I love a service or a product or something, and then I'm like, well, I don't know if it's a great business, right? Like, right, I, right. I don't know if there's a big difference between those two things. It can be an amazing service, but not a great business. You can also right? make money in that d- delta between when it's like everyone loves it and when it's you may really realize it's not a very good business. Totally. And that you can make money like that, but that's kind of icky money, right? Oh, it's yeah. Like, I mean, the top decile vintage uh, of this past year were probably, or two years, yeah. are going to be people that got out of crypto. It's a greater fool theory, right? Yes. That's not a great, I wouldn't love to make money, but people do, whatever, they can do that. I like people make things that actually are really great business. And one of the things around Twitter, for example, has just not been a great business. Like, it's a great influence platform. Again, it's one of those things. It's like, how's he actually going to make money from this? I mean, he could make a little, I guess. But so far, I don't see it as being like Google advertising. <laughs> like, yeah. I, you know what I mean? Like, there's clearly Facebook. inherent things to the medium, to how it advertises, to how people use it, right? It just media is a hard business. I, you know, when, when remember when Andreessen and us and they started Future, I do. Now, like, we're gonna displace tech. I was like, media is really hard. You'll and then see. launched with a blog. No, I was like, it's hard. It's hard to make any money. If you make money, you're actually really good. It's not a very lucrative business anymore. So I don't know what you're doing here with the rest of us, but we just happen to like it and we managed to get by. But it was, you know, it was interesting. Well, that's what's advantageous. I actually, because my job is investing, I get to do this as a fun side thing and I get mm-hmm. to wave my hands and say, yeah. hey, I'm not a journalist or this isn't that's my great. business, right? That's great. To improve illumination, it's, there's lots of reasons to do it. I just was sort of like, we're going to, I remember, we're going to displace you. I'm like, good luck. Like, yeah. good fucking luck. Good luck. Yeah. Well, that's the getting licked up and down syndrome. Like yeah, that's, right? I was like, okay, sure, you can do because you can do one thing, you could do the other thing. It's just not the case. I'm not. I wouldn't be a good investor at all. What would you do if if not journalism? <sighs> I've said this before. I would own a donut store in Hawaii. Oh, wow. <laughs> that's what I would do. Just like a little business, like run a little business. I think you'd be too restless doing that. No, but. I would not. You're really? wrong. You're a hundred percent wrong. I'd be perfectly happy. I was actually, I'd be perfect. I'd be happy to disappear. And I would, I would, I was saying uh, in a recent podcast, I was like, someone would come in and like, are you Kara Swisher? I'd be like, no, never heard of (laughs) I get that all the time. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's weird. I, you know, I gain a lot of weight. That's what I do. <laughs> just yeah. Well, you're in a donut there. shop, right? So Facts. People love donuts. People right. love donuts. People are happy buying donuts. They're never angry buying donuts. It's a better business than fraud or, or Fried or dough WeWork. isn't always a good business for the re- the, till the end of time. And now that people can take Osempic, that's even better. That's kind of weird. That well, thing. on that note, Kara Swisher, Sempic. thank you. Are you taking a Sempic? Is it a big in the VC world? Is it no, big in I'm the- not. I, I it's not. big in your little world. I know. I, listen, I am excited that there are people innovating on stuff like this. It's a it's uh, not innovation. It's something else. It's just it's, it's something else. You know, yeah, let me just make this point about this Sempic thing. Everyone's like, "Oh, this is groundbreaking." Whatever. It's literally you. you when when teenage girls have weirdness around eating, it's called bulimia. You know, when it's when it's rich white men, it's like, oh, I'm a body hacking. I'm yeah, like, it's file hacking is what it is. Yeah, <laughs> whatever. It's it's bulimia for white old white men. That's like, right. I'm sorry, whatever. Okay, sure. Listen, <laughs> I, I I'm glad other people are out there figuring this stuff out. I don't want to be doing these things to my body, but yes, that's no true. one's going to figure this stuff out. They yeah. are a hundred percent. They'll be a great business. Agreed, but it, it has to be healthy. It actually, and again, I you know not to go off the rails a little bit on this, but it's interesting. We have all these different treatments or healthcare mm-hmm. things that we do uh, when we have a disease, but there really mm-hmm. isn't anything, be it a vitamin or anything we take that is. Mm-hmm anti-aging or, or just widespread consensus belief that it actually makes you healthier, live longer, anything like that. So yes, I agree. I agree. If it's healthy, I'm all for anything that helps you not die of heart disease at a young age because you eat too much, you know, anything like that. I'm By good. the way, uh, how are you? You, you had surgery oh, recently. Are you- yeah, I had heart surgery. Yeah. Uh-huh. Good. Really good. It was, what's amazing is I had a stroke 10 years ago and it's because I have a hole in my heart, which is very, it's actually common. Roger McNamee had the same thing. Hmm. 20% of people have this thing. It's a hole that is there when you're born and then it closes up for most people and 20% of people it doesn't. And you only find out when you have a stroke or something like that or a pulmonary embolism. Is there any and, way to get an MRI, like any preventative way of? of- no, not re- I guess you could. It's called a bubble test, but nobody gets it. It's very hmm. expensive and you don't get it just because you, you know, you think you have it. And so, um, I found it by a th- by a stroke, and so I um, 
I had t- 10 years ago when I had it, it was open heart surgery and I refused to do it. I was like, they kept saying, oh, it's minor, but open heart. I'm like, yeah, no, like Those so much. Those two words are at odds with what I was like, there's no such thing as minor open heart surgery. Yeah. And so uh, now it went, it literally, they did a vein through your groin area, the vein, it goes, whatever, the vena cava, whatever it goes, it's a big vein. It goes up through there. It put this little device, this little uh, plastic, essential. It's, it's not plastic, but it's a version of plastic uh, device in there. It, attaches in balloons and closes up the hole. It's fascinating. 20 minutes. I was out that day. I went in the morning, nine o'clock. I was out by three. Crazy. And I'm fine. I had no repercussions whatsoever. Anyway. Wow. I know, well, right? Good. I'm glad. I'm- Medicine. Yeah. Amazing, it's amazing, amazing shit going Healthcare down. Healthcare climate tech. Those right, are, exactly. Yeah. It was amazing. And I feel great. I had nothing. And now I'm have a cyber, I have a cyber heart and I will be living forever. You're going to be yeah. doing this for a long time. That is correct. Yeah, yeah that good. is correct. Well, thank you for doing this, Kara. All right. Thank you so much. So that'll do it for the 47th episode of Cartoon Avatars. Uh, thank you to Kara Swisher for coming on. Thank you to everyone for listening, for subscribing, for liking, for sharing, for reviewing, all of that stuff. Uh, and uh, look forward to seeing everyone next week on the 48th episode of Cartoon Avatars. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Have a good weekend.